Blessed love, brother and sister. It's not a shop and lesson. It's a palm to a video. I'm all titled uh, Nineveh, the city has been found, brother and sisters. Nineveh, the city has been found. Alright, brother and sisters. So, before I show you the video, I would like to add some history to uh, the city of Nineveh. If you look at the screen, brother and sisters, uh, the city of Nineveh, map of the city of Nineveh, right? Nineveh, which was situated at the confluence of the Tigris and Kosher rivers. Modern day Mosul, Iraq, was first settled in the 7th millennia BC. According to the Bible, Nimrod was, was the founder of the city in Genesis 10 11. Right? When you get an opportunity, brother, so you could go. Go, go check out Barashid 10, 11, right? Major excavations took place under the direction of Henry Layard from 1845 to 1854. The diagram pictures the result of those excavations, especially as they reflect the period of the Assyrian Empire 1420 to 609 BC. Right, brothers and sisters? Around 1000 BC, there occurred a great revival of Assyrian power and Nineveh became a royal city. It was a thriving city during the first half of the first millennium and contained such luxuries as public squares, parks, botanical gardens, and even a zoo. One of the great archaeological finds of the period is the Library of King. Ashur Banipal from 1699 to 1627 BC called Osinapar in Ezra 4 10. The size of the city was approximately 1,850 squares. The Book of Jonah reflects the flourishing nature of Nineveh at this time 3 1 1 to 5. Nineveh eventually fell to the Medes and Babylonians in 612 BC. The invading armies dammed the rivers that supplied water to the city causing a flood that broke through one of the perimeters was giving the foreign armies access to the city brothers and sisters right keep looking at the screen brothers and sisters here's another map of uh, Nineveh right and also as you can see on this map you see right there Tigris River Nineveh city is right along the Tigris River right and that's and by the way, brothers and sisters, that's in modern day Iraq, right? So once again, brothers and sisters, the city of Nineveh along the Tigris River, modern day Iraq, right? Here's another map: the city of Nineveh, capital of the Assyrian Empire, brothers and sisters. As you can see, it's a big river. I mean, it's a big city. You see, brothers and sisters, it's a big city, right? So. On that note, brothers and sisters, watch the video, like, share, subscribe, and free. Bless and love, brothers and sisters. Shalom. What I want to talk about today is the archaeological site of Nineveh. In order to do this, we have to go back to the mid-1800s. We have to understand that if Nineveh wasn't found in the Bible, nobody would have remembered it. Nobody would have gone looking for it. Nobody would have cared to excavate it. And so uh, the whole story of Nineveh and its excavation is Bible-driven. We are here in Mosul, Iraq. We're on top of the roof of the building that we're staying in. Mosul was the headquarters of ISIS during 2014 and 2015. And because of that, much of the city still lies in ruins. Um, we're up on this roof where we're staying. And right behind me, we're very close to the ruins of ancient Nineveh. <laughs> I can't think of a better example for how archaeology confirms the reliability of the Bible than the site of Nineveh.
Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It really supports me and the making of these videos. Also, I'll leave a link in the description below where you can order a copy of my book, Where God Came Down, The Archaeological Evidence. Thanks for making it number one in archaeology. And also keep in mind that it makes for a good gift to give to others. Nineveh is located on the Tigris River in northern Mesopotamia. In the book of Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Therefore the Bible calls Nineveh a great city. In 1820, the British agent Claudius Rich explored the ruins of Nineveh. Though he wasn't the first to visit these ruins, he was the first to publish an accurate description of them. He wrote, I rode on, passing through the area of Nineveh, the walls of Nineveh have become like the natural hills. This is what Claudius Rich described. The city wall line looks like a long natural hill. And this is where the stone wall in one of the many city gates has been exposed through excavation. This top plan was drawn in the mid-1800s and shows the city walls. This arrow shows the camera angle in the next shot showing the northeast corner of the city wall. These wall lines enclose the ruins of Nineveh, which can still be seen today. In this way, we can see the massive size of Nineveh, showing that the ruins of Nineveh match the descriptions of the city in the Bible. Jonah chapter 3 says, Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Keep in mind that the walls that can be traced in these ruins, these are just the inner city walls. There were also outer city walls and suburbs. And so the sheer size of these ruins matches the descriptions of Nineveh in the Bible, where it describes Nineveh as a great city, as a very large city, with a population of more than 120,000 people. West of the ancient city flows the Tigris River. And within the ruins are two mounds. The smaller, but more sacred of the two, is called Nebi Yunus, which in Arabic means the prophet Jonah. This preserves the name of the Israelite prophet in the Bible. The Lord had decided to destroy Nineveh because of the wickedness of the people. Only the more than 120,000 people living there didn't know about this destruction. So the Lord had compassion on them, and he sent them an Israelite prophet, Jonah, to speak to them and to warn them. Uh, this was a sign to them, because surely they knew about this guy and had heard about, they, this is the guy, they must have been thinking, that, that got swallowed by the huge fish that spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. And now he's here speaking to us about the coming destruction of our city. Maybe we should listen to him. And so when the king and the people heard Jonah's preaching, they repented. And the Lord relented and did not destroy the city, which allowed uh, Nineveh to continue in history until later it became the capital of the Assyrian Empire. On top of the Nebi Yunus mound was a mosque that Isis blew up in 2014. But underneath it were the ruins of a church that preserved the tradition that these were the ruins of Nineveh. In 1830, the British colonel, Robert Taylor, found among the ruins of Nebi Yunus a six-sided prism covered with cuneiform writing. This inscription, often referred to as the Taylor Prism, is currently on display in the British Museum. So this is the Taylor prism. The problem with the Taylor inscription is that back in 1830 when it was found, nobody could read a word of it. Northwest of Nebi Yunus is a second, much larger ancient mound called Kayunjik, and next to it flows the Koza River. So tradition and local knowledge and uh, the early explorers all identified the ruins across the Tigris River from Mosul to be those of Nineveh. However, by the mid-1800s, this had been brought into question because a few other scholars were identifying other sites as Nineveh. 
And so in order to establish these ruins as Nineveh, then evidence was going to have to be found. And to do this, the site was going to have to be excavated. So in 1849, the British adventurer, Austin Henry Laird, became determined to put the massive mound of Kayunjik to the spade. Based on the abundance of fragmented surface remains, Laird chose to begin his dig here, on the southwest corner of the mound. Laird struck a vertical shaft, and at a depth of about 20 feet, his dig team hit a row of fired bricks. After some more clearing, it soon became evident that the wall belonged to a monumental building, and over the next several weeks, the largest palace ever excavated began to be unearthed. He determined from the surface material that this would be a good place to dig, and so he uh, immediately struck the ruins of this palace complex uh, behind me here. Lining the inside of the mud brick walls of the palace were slabs of gypsum, where elaborate scenes of hunting, military campaigns, and other glorious accomplishments of the king were carved into the stone. And in his palace here, you have the mud brick wall, and this really shows how these Assyrian wall reliefs work. You have this huge slab of stone here, pressed up against the wall, lining the wall, and on the outside of it are carvings of, of uh, statues and, and people and gods, and, uh, and then writing. If you follow me over here, um, you see the slab of stone pressed up against the mud brick wall, and then you see cuneiform writing on the outside of it. Back in uh, the time of Laird, what he did is he dug along the walls. In fact, it's estimated that he dug about two full miles of walls, where when he had a really well-preserved relief, stone relief, then he would take that off the wall and ship it back to the British Museum. As Laird's excavation crew were uncovering this huge palace, they found its central courtyard and they dug to the front of the courtyard where they unearthed these two huge human-headed winged bulls that were side by side. And as they uncovered them, they realized that they were guarding the entrance to something that further excavation showed was a monumental hallway. As Laird excavated, he prepared a top plan of the palace he was uncovering. So I have the plans, his drawings here, and then what I try to do is I try to match up his plan with the site itself and understand where I am. These are the ruins of the palace Laird excavated, and this is Laird's top plan. These three arrows show the three passages at the front of the central court, and here they are in the ruins. The most monumental of these three passages was the one in the middle. And I think that what we're doing is we're walking right, right through this gap right here on his plan as we walk through here. Uh, you can follow me. When Laird began excavating the entrance to this central passage, his team found two human-headed winged bulls on either side of it. This proved to be just the beginning of a monumental hallway that led from the palace's central courtyard to its most important showroom. And so what we had here was a gap, and uh, then another gap, and a, a long hall going off of this main courtyard here. And at the end of that was the main showroom for the whole palace. Looking straight down, we see the ruins of the monumental hallway leading from the central courtyard into the showroom. The walls of this room at the end of the hall were lined with stone reliefs depicting the siege of a single city. The question Laird wanted to know was what important city was this, and to which Assyrian king did the palace he was excavating belong? 
The original stone reliefs from this room are on display in the British Museum in London, where they have recreated the showroom Layered Discovered. On the wall to the right of the showroom's entrance was a stone relief showing an Assyrian king sitting on a throne on top of a hill, watching the battle for the city. Above and to the left of the enthroned king was a short cuneiform inscription that solved the mystery. Since the decipherment of cuneiform was being advanced by scholars, Layard was able to include the translation of the inscription in his book about his excavations, which he published in 1853. It read, Sennacherib, the mighty king, king of the country of Assyria, sitting on the throne of judgment before the city of Lachish. I give permission for its slaughter. So keep in mind that, yes, they found the name Sennacherib engraved in stone, but this would have been meaningless except for the fact that Sennacherib is found in the Bible as the name of the Assyrian king whose capital is Nineveh. 2 Kings 19.36 says, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, returned to Nineveh and stayed there. So now it was known with certainty with the finding and translation of this inscription and other inscriptions found in this excavation, it was known with certainty that the ruins across the Tigris River from Mosul, this was Nineveh. And the building that Layard was excavating was the palace of Sennacherib and that this main showroom that uh, off of the main courtyard uh, was pointing to like a telescope was depicting the city of Lachish, the second most important city in the kingdom of Judah. And this was surprising because they were expecting it to be a much more important city, like the most important city of a nation, the most important city of an important nation. Uh, the most important city of the kingdom of Judah is the capital of Judah, which is Jerusalem. So why in this main showroom is it Lachish, the second most important city in the kingdom of Judah. The inscription on the Taylor prism could now also be read, and was an inscription of none other than Sennacherib himself. On it, Sennacherib says, As to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to forty-six of his strong cities, walled forts, and to the countless small villages in their vicinity, and conquered them. Notice that Hezekiah, the king of Judah in the Bible, is named by Sennacherib. This event is also recorded in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 36 says, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib king of Assyria attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. In the land of the Bible in the fall of the year we have the olive harvest, which is very distinct because uh, it's very violent actually because the way that olives are harvested from the trees are literally they're beaten out of the branches with these big sticks. And we have these falling olives. And so Isaiah uses this as a metaphor for the Assyrian invasion of Judah. And these falling olives that are being beaten out of the trees, these are the people dying, and these are the cities that are falling in the kingdom of Judah. from the central court looking down to the Lachish room in Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. Visible at the very end of the long monumental hall was the stone relief at the center of the back wall of the showroom, and carved on it was the siege ramp at Lachish. This 
piece is a stone picture of the siege of Lachish. And so you can see all these Assyrians coming up the siege ramp on either side here. You can see the the huge war machines with the battering rams. So in Second Chronicles 32.9, it says that while Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and his forces are laying siege to Lachish, that he sends his officers up to Jerusalem to deliver a message to Hezekiah and the people there. So we have the Bible and the Assyrian records coming together uh, in this event. This is the dramatic event between the Assyrian records and the Israelite records in the Bible. This is Tel Lachish, the mound of ruins of the city the Assyrians attacked in 701 BC. Since the Bible says that Sennacherib laid siege to Lachish, and since the stone reliefs from Sennacherib's palace show us a stone carving of the Assyrian siege ramp at Lachish, then it should not come as a surprise that in 1973 at Lachish, the Assyrian siege ramp was discovered and excavated. This is what the excavations looked like in 1973, and this is how they look today.